First of all, my name is Asiel Gutierrez. I am working for Huawei. Uh, I'm here to talk today about containers and security. Now, these are topics that were covered before in a previous talk on Tuesday uh, by a guy called Marcus, and sorry about that, Marcus uh, Magnus Kulka. And we will talk about very similar thing, but from a completely different point of view. So, um, you know, uh, for these three days, uh, we've heard a lot about regulations, about compliance. So we know that the US is looking into regulating security. We know the EU is looking into it. So a lot of companies are looking into how we can make sure things are secure. Okay, so compliance. Um, before I joined Huawei, like a few years ago, I used to work for a big telecom company. Um, we had tens of millions of subscribers. Then I moved to a small startup that we used to do legal tech. And a lot of the stuff that we had to do, we had to do comply all with a lot of laws and regulations. Now, um, one of the things we had to do at that time was to make sure the files were immutable, which means that obviously they haven't been modified. If file has been modified, we should know about that. Um, so uh, Linux has this wonderful thing called Integrity Measurement Architecture. It's part of the LSM, the Linux Security Module. So it's very, very simple. Uh, as soon as you, uh, as soon as the kernel receives an open and map or XV syscalls, if I am enable, I am enable in the kernel with all the correct appraisal and policies, then certain hooks will be fired up. Um, what happens next it depends on when this hook uh, is, is uh, executed. The first time we open a file. Uh, we will get the first hash of the file, the, the, the hash, the good hash to put in that way, uh, in a good state. And the next time we open a file, uh, we will just check the LSM and the IMA hooks, we'll check whether the, the hash is the previous hash or the new hash, they just match. If they don't match, well, depends. We, we may get notified, we may get denied, access to that file and so on. So uh, all of this actually works very nice. Um, all of this works along with the TPM chip, right? So all this goes onto the real uh, hardware inside, uh, well, um, a real server or computer. So um, talk about, about the TPM chip. Uh, the TPM chip is it's nothing more than a cryptographic chip. Is sold on the board, usually on most laptops or computer species. And it's pretty much a um, cryptographic chip. So it allows us to create true random numbers. Uh, we are able to um, perform cryptographic key generations, like provisioning. We have the possibility for remote attestation, which will look into a little bit later. And we have something called the PCR, which stands for uh, Platform Configuration Register. So these are specific registers uh, that they cannot be reset or deleted. Uh, you can only extend it. So when you first boot the computer, the, these registers are all zero. Well, not all of them, but many of them are zero. And whenever you want to put something into it, you need to extend that. Uh, and then this new extended result is put into the T this PCR. If you want to put something new, you need to extend the previous PCR with a new one, you get a new value and so on. So it's like a chain of hashes that you get there. Okay, so um, now as I said, we used to use this in my previous companies to make sure the files were modified. Now there is a thing, uh, in previous companies we used uh, physical servers. Now, at Huawei we thought, 
we want to have these in containers. We want to be able for people to use these kind of tools inside containers seamlessly, very easily. So this is how we came to this idea of having a new namespace. Now, we are based on the Linux uh, LXC, uh, LXC, LXD uh, container technology that is based on namespaces. We wanted that because it allows us room for a lot of improvement in terms of our resource management and because it has better performance than hypervisors like KVM or Xen. Uh, now, what we added, we, we thought we would add just a new namespace. We call it the IMA namespace. Uh, obviously, since we are working in the open source community and we wanted our work to be useful to other people as well, we thought maybe somebody looked at this problem before. So we found these two people, these two individuals over here, uh, Stefan Berger and Christian Browner, they are two IBM engineers, they've been working on uh, IBM, uh, on, on, sorry, on IMA namespaces for quite some time. And they have a, a set of patches that they released to the LKN, to the Linux uh, mail list. So we took it as, as our baseline to, to further improve it. Obviously, all the improvements that we, we made, we also published it in the Linux kernel community, so they're out there available for you if you want. Uh, okay, so the previous work by these IBM engineers, uh, they are based, uh, they, based, they created these IMA namespaces based on the user namespace. So you cannot create an IMA IM namespace without a user namespace. Uh, the reason why they did that is because it's probably the less painful way to, to get this done. There are other ways to do it, more flexible, but they are more complex and they may break things as well. Uh, we made some changes though. Uh, so these IMA patches that were f first released, they didn't suit our, our goals. So we made some changes. One of them is we added some kind of some VPCR. So VPCR stands for virtual uh, PCR. Uh, these are, virtual PCRs inside the container. So to the, to the container, it will look like a, a real hardware PCR, but they are just like emulations. Uh, another thing that we did is we changed the way we activate this uh, IMA namespace. So now we have, uh, we activate it through, through PROCFS. And well, th this approach of having actually uh, the I my name is space linked to the username space has a number of advantages like having different key rings. So one um, username is space or one container we contain a completely different key from other container. No shared keys, no shared values, nothing. Okay, um, <clears throat> so this is not nutshell how it works or how it looks like. So we have a username space related to IMA namespace. There is no way you can create an IMA namespace without user namespace. And then you have a number of containers. Each container will have its own IMA policy rules, appraisals, and so on. Something very similar to what, what you have with uh, hardware, a real hardware server, but in containers. Okay. Um, now, this is in slightly more detail of what we do and what we try to do. Uh, what we have here are three pods, pod one, two, and three. Uh, and then you have the IMA measurement lists. So as you can see, well, it says hash one, hash one, hash one. They are like different files in, in each container, it just doesn't matter. It's like the hash, the hash of first file in first container and so on. So what we do is, having all these virtual PCRs, we are able to do the same thing as a hardware uh, PCR. So these are not resettable. We just need to extend them. So this provides like a complete chain. If one of the links in that chain fails, the hash will be modified. We will know about that. So this is what you see there. 
uh, you have hash uh, the well the kind of o orange or brownish uh, boxes that's the for, for pot one we extend that one we extend the one for pot two for pot three as well and what you end up with is just a hash that will identify that container which we call it cpcr so a cpcr is container pcr and it identifies the extension of all the files for that container and all these cpcrs will go to the tpm chip to the actual chip because what we want is containers to be secure but we want them to be linked to the actual cryptographic chip because this is very important to maintain the root of trust uh, one thing important here is these red boxes over there so what we have is we create kind of a fake container um, this uh, we call it like the container zero and this container is actually not a real container it will be linked to security affairs and it will contain the hashes extension of hashes of some of the IMA policies so what we are trying to achieve this way is if somebody has access to the root file system to the actual host uh, if he changes some of the policies or some of the security affairs files we will know that about it as well and this goes to the tpm chip as well so um, now this is how it works in, in reality this i took it a couple of weeks ago from our test machine okay so what you have there in the very beginning is the host uh, this is like the normal IMA uh, stuff that you can enable in any Linux machine nowadays. Uh, I just listed the first five entries. There are a lot of them. So what you have is you see all these files are stored in PCR zero. Uh, we have the hashes for the file and the file names. Okay. Then we have the container. So. When I say container, this is if we are inside the container already, okay? And we have a, the very same file, we have it exposed, ASCII runtime measurement. And we see exactly the same thing as, as the host, right? So we see uh, PCR10, hashes, and the files. But these are files not in the host, they are in the container, inside the container. Okay, finally, what we have here in the host, we have a new file that we expose with our Linux uh, patches, with our kernel patches. It's called ASCII vpcr. Uh, and what we have is these cpcrs, the container pcrs, like a hash that will identify that container entirely. Uh, we have the container UUID. This is a UUID for future cases. We don't use it at the moment, but it's a UUID created by the Linux kernel. Uh, we, have, we have the name space ID as well that will identify that container. And then we have the PCR12. So all these CPCR or container PCRs will be stored in PCR12 on the physical TPM chip. Um, okay, um, so this is how it works. Very, very simple. So we have an extension of all these VPCRs. We will get a final CPCR and all these CPCRs will be also extended one after another. Um, we will end up with a hash that is put into PCR12 on the actual TPM chip. Okay? So this way we can make sure that uh, nobody modified any, any any hash in the actual CFS and try to get a, get around it. So, uh, okay. Um, so, you know, all that I explained was just kernel stuff, and this is very nice, but this is useless in practice because, well, yeah, I can build a container, and what do I do with it? So nowadays, most people run cloud um, cloud environments and what we have here is just like a very simple diagram explaining we have one or more control planes that are synced we have at least one but we usually we have many nodes 
with Kubelet, which is going to take care of that node in Kubernetes, uh, container D, run C, and then the container running on top of the kernel, inside the kernel. Okay, um, so this is more in more detail. So what we wanted is to have something that can be used in real life, and most people in real life use Kubernetes. So we try to build something for Kubernetes that uses IMA namespaces. To achieve that, we need to change all these blue boxes. So we need to change API server for, and the control planes. We need to change kubelet in the nodes. We need to change container D run C. And we need to change the interfaces as well. So from the client to a control plane, from the control plane to kubelets, and CRI and OCI as well. So see how it works. We talk about the kernel. Um, now it's time to talk about the user space. So this is just above the kernel. Who creates a container? Usually it's runs uh, This is just a very primitive diagram showing the runcy um, algorithm, how it creates namespaces. I didn't put all the steps. What I put there is just, a, you see, like a red line. This is where we create the, the user and the, the IMA namespace. So we first need to create the user namespace with all the mapping and all that stuff. Then we create, we added some patches to create the, the IMA namespace. And then we continue with the regular flow. So we create the mount file namespace, group, and so on and so forth. So, uh, the question here is uh, an important fact here is uh, this creation, the creation of, of this Iman in space, we will only do it if we, get, if we get something from the upper layer. So if we are told from the upper layer that this container should have Iman in space, maybe not all containers need to have Iman in space, maybe some of them. So I talk a little bit about changes in the API. So these are the changes that we made in the API. Uh, what we have is in the OCI, in case you don't know, this is just like a, a normal JSON file that describes how the container is created. Uh, there is a section called namespaces. We just add a name and namespace. The CRI, in case you don't know, is the protocol that links kubelet with container D, uh, and this is mainly a modified version of gRPC. This is gRPC over uh, Unix sockets. Uh, we just added a new flag there. We call it bool, bool iman, that's it. So just bear in mind that the, we have that in the Linux sandbox security context. Uh, sandbox actually means inside Kubernetes means pod. So we are enabling IMA for the entire pod, right? And then we have in Kubernetes, we, this is the, the actual YAML file that you will use to deploy a pod. So we have in red, a new flag, we say IMA. And we have in blue, host users false. So, no, no, so host user false is a way you can uh, tell Kubernetes to create uh, a pod with username spaces. Okay, otherwise it won't work. Obviously, we made also some changes, minor changes to kubelet, container D, and API server. I didn't put those here, but you know, they're like mainly sanity checks, and we changed some formats and so on. So it's nothing really major. So for example, if you want to create an IMAN in space and you, don't, you didn't specify the username in space, okay, it will fail out. So. Okay, um, so uh, when I talk about um, the TPM chip, I mentioned remote attestation. So it's important for us uh, to know that the container is in good health. So again, everything that we've done, yeah, yeah, you are now able to deploy these uh, containers in Kubernetes and so on with IMAN, it's all good. But how do you know, how does the, 
the DevOps engineer know that a particular uh, container, a particular pod, has been compromised. So we created a special controller for Kubernetes. We call it an integrity controller. <clears throat> and we have um, also these two red boxes there. So we have the attested daemon set. Daemon set is something that is in Kubernetes that allows uh, every time a, a host uh, joins the cluster, it will automatically get this attester pod deployed automatically. And then we have in a completely different machine, we have a verifier pod, okay? That runs as a cron job. So the DevOps engineer can come in, you know, you can set it up to run every 10 minutes, every hour, every day, whatever. Now, it's important to know that the attester and the verifier, uh, they are linked directly to the TPM chip, okay? So we use a device plugin in Kubernetes to expose the, the physical TPM chip to these pods. These are actually privileged pods as well. So, um, just, this is in a nutshell how it works. So, we create a, a pod, Cube API server receives the command to create a pod, uh, it tells Kubelet to create the pod, and our integrity controller will be notified about this pod creation. It's in the watchers list. Uh, then after that, the integrity controller will try to get through a tester pod, which has access to the TPM chip. We will get the golden hash for that, that container, like the good hash, hash for a container that hasn't been modified. And then we have a loop, again, every hour, every month, whatever, that where we will create a verifier pod. Okay, this is how um, cron jobs work in Kubernetes. The verifier pod will ask the integrity controller, which is the one that keeps all these gold hashes for all these containers. Um, give me the gold hashes for all the containers Inside my, in this machine, okay? And then it will go to the tester pod for each on each of these nodes and say, I want you to get me all the P P PCI, all the container hashes for all the IMA enabled pods in your host. If something works, fine. If everything matches, fine. If something doesn't match, we will report it to the security controller and this one back to Kubernetes. So this way, Kubernetes has access to, to all this information, which pod actually failed. Okay, um, we're almost done, but we are not done yet. Uh, we found a lot of issues when we tried to build all this huge project. Uh, so we had some roadblocks. These roadblocks, the first one is what happens when pods are deleted. It's an interesting question because in Kubernetes, the way you update the pod uh, the, is you basically you create a new pod with a new version, you delete the old one, okay? Uh, now, if you delete the pod, uh, in the previous slide where I show the CPCRs in the host, the CPCR for the deleted pod will be gone, okay? And if we replay all that chain with all the hashes, we will end up with a situation where it just doesn't work. The PCR 12 doesn't match, right, with what we got. We are thinking about how to fix that. There are different ideas, just, but this doesn't work yet. Uh, another problem is what happens with non-overlapping policies. So um, what happens when you have, right now, the way we build is all the ports in, 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 a con in, in a node share the same policy. This means that we just record all the files that can be read or can be executed or whatever. What happens if we want to have a pod where we want to register, we want to make sure the executable files are not changed, and another pod where we want to do that, but for all files. This can't be done at the moment. We're just thinking, you know, what can we do about it? 
Shared storage and NFS, that's a big one as well, uh, because a lot of pods actually use external storage. They use S3, they use NFS and so on. Uh, that's a big issue because all what you saw the here, all these IMA and so on, it relies on a very simple thing, and it's extended attributes for each file. So the Linux kernel provides extended attributes. IMA, the hashes for the files as Britain extended attributes. If those extended attributes are not there, like is the case for NFS, for example, well, there is nothing we can do about it, right? Uh, stateful, uh, stateful pods. So again, this is a hard one to, to fix. Now, what happens if you want a stateful pod? Pod whose files can be changed. So you may want to have like a folder that can be changed another folder that cannot be changed. Uh, as I said, these, the, the IMA namespaces that we built are linked to the user namespaces. And currently, user namespaces only work for stateless pods. So the current implementation, there is no way we can get it working with stateful pods. This is one issue that we may need to fix. And what happens with multi-container pods? So, in it and it's ephemeral containers, I'm not going to talk about them, but sidecar, sidecar containers are important because a lot of people use them for service mesh architecture, and this is very important to get them working as well. So we just have a lot of issues. We don't know how to fix them. Uh, well, so we have, we have some ideas, but still a lot of work to be done. So, in case you want to see our work, you have the, the GitHub links and so on. Um, again, what we try to do with this project is we try to link the kernel side and the user, user space side. Um, what you find actually is, if you talk to the Kubernetes community, they will tell you, you know, this feature looks very nice, but we, we, we cannot work on it because there is no kernel support. You talk to the kernel community, they said, we don't know what the user space wants from us. So we are hoping that we can get contributions from any of you. Uh, that's my email address, so you can, you know, email me if you want. But yeah, we, we want to actually work together, people from the kernel side, from the user space side, so we can get something really working for in real life environments. Thanks a lot to my colleagues. So you have the Denis Samakin, Ilya Hanov, and Siebolod Sabinski. So all what you saw here today uh, couldn't be done without their hard work. So well, thanks a lot to them. Well, I'm done. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. <laughs> Right, so the question is about the overhead of uh, all these CPCR and so on. Uh, no, unfortunately, we, haven't, we don't get any figure at the moment. Uh, so we, we're trying to build this some, some kind of functional uh, prototype that we can use and at least have all the features that we need. Uh, after that, we can you know, get the performance numbers and optimize them. So, if no more questions, thanks a lot for watching and for attending this. And you know, I hope to see some of you maybe next year. Thanks a lot.